From 1988 to 1990, current Communist Party General Secretary and Chinese President Xi Jinping served as party chief of Ningda, which is a medium-sized city in the Fujian province. The city hosts a population of 2.8 million and is one of the poorest cities in China. Most of the work there is agricultural, subsidence farming level stuff. After he ascended to the party general secretary position, his speeches during this period of time were grouped together and distributed as study materials for the party faithful to study. I picked it up for a good read. Alleviating poverty is a major concern for the Communist Party and the world at large. I wanted to hear some of Xi's strategies for how to do it. China has a Rust Belt problem, similar to that that is being experienced in the United States. And I've written about this in another in another post. But Ningda does not appear to be one of those Rust Belt type cities. No, Ningda appears to always have been poor. The city is located in the region of Fujian, which has always been one of China's poorest regions, starved for resources from the central government. Much of the economy has not modernized. It relies heavily on farming the largely unproductive ground. She acknowledges this in one speech. This is an old revolutionary Soviet era with large minority populations. We are recognized as having impoverished counties and receive preferential policy treatment. On the one hand, our economy is underdeveloped. On the other hand, the state also shows its concern for the region. We must face up to this problem and not let poverty bring our spirits down. There is evidence that Fujian's poverty, and thus Ningda's, is endemic and stretches back centuries. For a long time, Fujian's most significant exports has been its own people, with waves of them striking out to greener pastures for work. Much of the Han population in Singapore and Taiwan hail from Fujian, for example. A substantial portion of the local economy runs on the money sent back from their overseas workers, making, in some ways, Fujian the Philippines of China. She stepped into this post for two years with the goal of breaking the cycle of poverty. So obviously, during his time there, not much substantial progress was made. But during his time, we got an idea of how he thinks it can be done conceptually. And the first start is to don't look at government for the solution. In his speeches, the future president emphasizes that in this new era of economic development, the central government would not be in a position to help everyone. This differs from the communist revolutionary Mao years, where the government can be expected to provide for everything. Here he makes this point in addressing the possibility of the government building a railway to Ningda. And he says, Railways need huge funds to build, and it is up to the state planners to decide where and when to build them. That is not something we can just go and do ourselves. Of course, we can provide reasonable recommendations and work hard to promote the idea, but such a project will not be realized in the coming period. I get the sense that Xi is trying to deliver a nuanced message. He knows that the government is not going to funnel much resources to these poor areas, which is bad news that nobody wants to hear. And too much bad news can promote social unrest in this area, which is a crucial demerit for any Communist Party secretary. Thus, the way he attempts to thread the needle is interesting. Taking up a perspective of refreshing frankness, he attempts to get his people to buy into a long-term development plan of little steps, his so-called super modest plan to riches. His speeches for economic growth outline a simple plan, and he says, We will develop the three types of foreign-funded enterprises according to our abilities, working on trade with Taiwan, using traditional ports and major coastal towns to develop trade, and working hard to create our own features in opening up to the outside world. She's first gold posts in liberalizing certain previously closed markets with the goal of making it more attractive to foreign investment. An investor might come by and be interested in taking their money and building a factory, for example, to take advantage of the cheaper labor costs. The investor might also be interested in other options the city government can offer, like tax breaks, cheap reliable resources, such and such. But it's more than just tax breaks. Uh, and she mentions this too. And he says, the practice of opening up in many locations the past few years has proven that tax exemptions and deductions are not as attractive as we thought. As foreign companies not only want to save money, they also want to make more money and be able to do business easily and smoothly. This is a point that more governments should consider, especially in the United States. Tax breaks are nice to have, but they leave a bad taste in people's mouths, and they do not as effectively promote sustainable businesses as other factors. Here's a Taiwanese example. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company is the island's flagship company, the pride of its manufacturing sector. They build multi-billion dollar fabs across the island in scattered cities. What, has, uh, fa what factor has been most important to them? Not the size of the tax break, but the assurance of reliable resources like water, electricity, and of course, government cooperation. The challenge for, the, for these governments though, is that offering these additional items requires actually developing your people, infrastructure, bureaucracy, and location to a point where it can be attractive. That is a long-term thing, 
something that can be hard to focus on when considering the next election is always just a few years away. At the same time, the city government is tasked with searching out what the city denizens already currently do well and figure out ways to ascend the value chain and produce exports that other people want. A conceptual example of this is a farm that for the longest time grew apples, receiving a government grant to upgrade its facilities to also sell apple pies for a higher margin and great better prices. Secretary Xi identified agriculture as Ningda's comparative advantage, and his playbook for growing the area's economy is in upgrading the efficiency and productivity of the sector through the promotion of big agriculture. And he says, but we must go beyond traditional farming under the constraints of the natural economy and step up to big agriculture in the comprehensive commodity economy. Xi's strategy goes beyond simply imposing a guide on the area as a whole. He dives into the specialty of each town and urges the local governments and industries there to focus on developing that particular speciality. And he says, investment policies targeting leading industries can be formulated and implemented to expedite their development. In turn, growth in the leading industries will drive the development of upstream and downstream industries. For example, Gu Tian has the deep processing of mushrooms, Jerong has pharmaceuticals, Xia Pu has massage tools and processing of seaweed, nori, and mustard root, and Fu An has electrical machinery and ferro alloys. The idea behind this again is that once this small niche industry industrializes and expands, it's able to drive the growth of adjacent industries that will in turn employ larger and larger amounts of people. This is reminiscent of the company town model where a single large company employs the majority of a town's residents. Does Xi's plan for poverty actually work though? The economy has developed in the subsequent decades. Ningda remains agricultural, but it has scaled the value chain, exporting fruits and some specialty teas. The large number of shallow seas has allowed for the development of an agriculture, aquaculture actually, industry that exports yellow croakers, oysters, and clams. However, the people of Ningda remain poor, lagging behind its peers within the province and China as a whole. GDP per capita is growing, but at roughly 8,600 USD, it lags the rest of the Fujian province, which clocks in about 14,000. And the population continues to decline, with the area losing some 4,000 people from 2016 to 2017. Why would its young people stay in Ningda raising clams and taking care of the olds, when they can be in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Beijing working in a comfortable air-conditioned office job and making lots of money? Uh, Ningda is just one of the many towns, cities, prefectures, and provinces in China struggling with the inequalities of urbanization and poverty. China's economy continues to advance towards more complicated manufacturing technologies and services, which risks leaving these smaller areas even further behind. Looking at Xi's strategy for alleviating their poverty leaves me wondering if there's hope for them in the future.